stay upright. I'm skiing all that long. <laughs>
Vino Lamonte from Carter Resources. Vino. And, and Mike Gilman from our Board of Selectmen. Right. In exchange for that, Mike will refer to me as distinguished as well. First of all, the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you bestowed upon us in this community, in our state, and in our nation. Lord, the hand that you've held tight through history. Lord, that you continue to guide us, that you protect us. Lord, that this evening, that you have a hand upon the conversation, upon the hearts and the minds of those present. Lord, that you protect us in our comings and goings during the week, particularly tonight when we leave. But Lord, we want to ask for your blessing upon this food, and Lord, that you have a hand uh, on the days to come. And we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Uh, now a few administrative tasks to make this officially an annual meeting. We will be electing our officers and directors of 2012. I'll be reading off your names, if each of you can please stand uh, for this. Um, our incoming president is going to be Alicia Bosnick from the Family Savings Bank. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Alicia. Neil Stafford, is Neil here? Neil? Neil Stafford from H&R Block will be our vice president. Um, Greg Allaire from Littleton Chevrolet. John, John Hennessy will be our treasurer this coming year. Tony Aquar Sr. Uh, we'll continue on the board, Tony. Tony was retired in quotation marks, it should be. I think Tony's got the memo on him retiring yet. Um, Aaron James from Vermont Broadcasting Associates. Aaron. Ed King from the, the co-op. Ed. Peter Minnick, I don't think he's made from uh, Pazumsic Savings, Peter, um, will be remaining on the board. Uh, Alan Smith, Al, from the from school. Al. <laughs> Sylvie Weber from the Caledonian. <laughs> And then we have three new directors for this year. Um, first one is Trevor Hardy, who is the manager at Walmart. Trevor. <laughs> We're really happy to have some representation from some of the bigger stores down on the Meadows. Uh, Trevor's bringing that to us. Trevor has been in uh, Littleton for a year now. He's, um, he's, he's moved here from Buffalo, New York. He's an avid Bills fan. And uh, he's ready for the Bills, the Bills game this weekend. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Jody Hodgman from Swan and Russell will be joining the board this year. Jody, thank you. Jody's a power hitting first baseman. Will really give us uh, something in the middle of the order for the, um, the chamber, uh, the chamber softball team. I guess. Lynn Routine, Quakeling, that boots right now, Jody. 
thank you. Uh, Stacy Northrup is not here, but uh, Stacy is the owner of Bailiwick's Fine Restaurant and Martini Bar. I, I hear it's great. I look forward to, uh, to, to, to visiting it um, with my free time in, in the coming year. <laughs> but uh, Stacy, Bailiwick's, they worked out the uh, last several years, really grown that business. Um, they've expanded recently, and uh, it's great to see. And I really think they've become one of the anchors for Main Street, so it's great to have. Stacy on board as well. So, as your board of directors for the incoming year, we will have a vote on that. Before we vote, uh, all those in favor of this incoming slate, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. Board of directors has passed. Uh, the final little bit of business here is also on the last page, inside that cover of your, of your program is, is our budget. Um, Chad. The incoming treasurer, John Hennessy, taught Chad how to reduce the, uh, the font on this so that nobody could see it. <laughs> Thank you for that guidance, John. <laughs> well, well, this is our board. Uh, now that you've all had the chance to review it, uh, all those in favor of the, you know, the 2012 budget, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? I think my son just voted against it. But, uh, that's all right. All those opposed, no? The motion passes. Wonderful. Okay. So now, this, um, we'll have a greeting from uh, Larry from the, the Mount Washington. We are thrilled to be here once again this year. Every year, uh, the Mount Washington works with us and does a great job, pulls this off, and we always get such favorable feedback from this that we're happy to be here yet again. Once again, Larry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the 1,100 plus um, associates of the Omni Mount Washington Resort and the Brentwood Ski Area, we're delighted to welcome you all and to welcome our neighbors from the Littleton Area Chamber of Commerce to, to the property. It's uh, certainly something we look forward to every year. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity, of course, to welcome our, our dignitaries, Governor Huntsman. Uh, welcome to the uh, the home of the oldest motorcycle rally in, in, in the country. If you, if you don't want to ride your Harley all the way over here, you can borrow mine to ride down to, to, ride down to the car. Enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Please enjoy your dinner, and we'll be resume the program right after dinner. Thank you. Looking at our normal operations, events have really improved this year, which we hope to continue improving upon next year. Depending on how you look at it, we either ended the previous year or began this year with our annual dinner in this very room. With Nancy Rice Company Citizen of the Year and former Red Sox pitcher Billy entertaining us at the end of the night. Those who have participated in the annual trade expo and home show underneath the tent at Home Depot in previous years, braving the wind, snow, rain, dampness, we're extremely happy uh, to finally turn to a dry and warm, calm atmosphere inside the Open House Lodge, and so are all the customers that came to join us uh, for that beautiful weekend. The annual golf tournament was once again a great time had by all, especially with the wedding party that happened to join us at the tail end and then continued to fun into the evening hours. The Littleton Art Show returned to Main Street for the second straight year. It was absolutely perfect. Artists lined the streets, the hanging flowers adorned the Victorian land posts. And the, the Lions Club Antique Car Parade um, was once again um, created on Main Street. Um, thanks to the help of the volunteers and police service who were able to provide special detail for the parade. Um, with the beautiful weather, the foliage, patrons came out in droves to enjoy the day's events back in the downtown. November saw the economic development celebration and the Christmas parade, both with record numbers of celebrated accomplishments and attendees, respectively. Proving to us what we already know, that Littleton is alive and well and continues to be the hub of the North Country. The year in Littleton was not all cheerful and rosy, however. I'm sure most of us here tonight remember the spring with budget cuts, layoffs, boycotts. Not that I had too many springs uh, under my belt, but it was um, surely one of the more tumultuous springs in Littleton that I can remember. Um, it rose from this, however, as a stronger, more engaged Littleton with leaders popping up out of what seems from nowhere to get their hands dirty and work on a common goal of improving Littleton. 
Merchants on Main Street, Woodlong feared disaster from reconstruction in the economy, once again came out to support the downtown by taking care of the hanging flowers. Some flowers took it a bit harder than others, a few you know, meeting their demise, but nonetheless, downtown Milton has not looked as great uh, as it did this summer for quite some time. We've all either heard of, read, or participated in the Littleton Area Community Project. Although perhaps, um, although perhaps full of far-reaching ideas, and at times a bit daunting and trying, the project also brought us huge successes such as the Piano Project. News of this was seen as far away as Texas, but more importantly, lifted the, the spirits of, com of the community fighting within itself. Every day I walk to the post office, I, I get the paper, and every time I walk by someone playing the piano, I couldn't help but smile. I don't know why, but I, you just smile walking by someone playing on those pianos. Um, and other people would, would be smiling too. It, that was just an amazing feeling. Um, and if we can all smile, then it's much easier not to agree on everything, but to agree to, to disagree and, and become better neighbors. Um, the Piano Project was also great in spurring other engaged neighbors to step up to the plate and work on a project not out of self-promotion, but, uh, but promoting a fun time in Littleton and wanting to draw guests and visitors from around the area to Littleton. About a month before Halloween, a huge stump washed down on the flat rocks behind Littleton Bike and Fitness. And David Harkless, um, owner of Littleton Bike and Fitness, was sitting in his computer and says, you know what, I think that looked pretty cool with a jack o' lantern on it. Um, so he put his waders on and he went out to the flat rocks and he put a jack o' lantern down. Uh, and he just started thinking, and before you know it, we had this event a couple days before Halloween, and there's hundreds of pumpkins out, and there's hundreds of people out to see the jack o' uh, It was a huge day for Littleton. A few months later, Dick Alvarini, who had toiled with the idea last year, um, went full steam ahead this year with the Littleton Victorian Christmas. Uh, and that was a huge success as well. Carolers adorned the streets. Businesses were open and decorated past five o'clock. <laughs> there were bell ringers in the opera house. And most importantly, customers came out to see what was going on, enjoy the night, and spend money downtown. So when we look back at 2011, we did some conventional work and some unconventional work. No matter what path you were part of through this, the result was the same. A promoted, marketed, eventful, welcoming, smiling, engaged, celebrated Hilton. And that's why we're here tonight. Thank you. Good evening. We are pleased to be here this evening to honor one of Littleton High School's students as the Outstanding Student of the Year. You may wonder why I'm here, Deb Steinauer, to assist with this presentation. I'm like a fill-in talk show hostess on a television program. I'm standing in for Mrs. Nancy Reitsema, who is our Community Service Coordinator at the school and last year's Citizen of the Year. She has a family obligation tonight and was unable to attend and asked me to stand in for her. It's always nice to see if you can surprise the recipient of these events, um, but in this case, I'm afraid she's fully aware of why she is here. However, we might be surprising some of you, the audience, when we finally do announce her name. Her mother's maiden name is one that holds many memories for me as I first met her mother's parents in 1965 when they rented their first apartment in Littleton for my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Nast. A young couple with no children, they came from New York, where I had just moved from. What was great was that they had the same kind of funny accent that I did, like coffee and chocolate. <laughs> they didn't laugh at me at school. <laughs> 
and her grandpa was so funny, just like my uncles that I had left behind. Many years passed, and her daughter came to be my assistant when I was a new cheer bee coach at LHS, and she was a young college student. Many more years passed by, and she had a baby, the young woman we are about to meet. Names create images. I don't know about you, but they do for me. And when I hear their name, I see people eager to be active participants in the world around them. They never idle, they're never without anything. They're full of life and energy, and they pour it over other people, especially to young people. They love their family, and they assist each other, and every one of them to reach their goals and to seek and attain whatever they aspire to do and be. Their name is linked directly with life, living fully, taking advantage of all the opportunities that there are for them out in the world. This student has fully challenged herself and taken advantage of the opportunities presented to her. She is an honor student who has been excelling academically all of her high school years, probably even in elementary school. She is currently ranked fifth in her class and serves as the class vice president and president of the student council. She's an active member of the LHS National Honor Society, as well as youth and government, which I'm sure her grandpa had a lot to do with. Outside of the classroom, this student is extremely involved. She has been an all-star cheerleader and been on the team for the past 12 years and has been a cheer camp instructor for five of those years. She also participates in field hockey, softball, and basketball. I had my nails done this afternoon and, I, and the woman who did it, I told her where I was going, what I was doing, and she said, and I just mentioned cheer, and she said, oh, but she does everything else, basketball, you know, she, you know that, Debbie, she does everything. So other people know about you, too. And while I have talked a great deal about her mom's family, I don't know her dad's family, but I do know her dad. He's a gentle human being with a calm approach to life that makes you feel right at ease. Also, he's pretty darn good at managing a bunch of toddlers, spaghetti suppers, and concerts at school. Nothing short of major disasters could move this man. I know that this young lady carries these traits with her, and I've even seen her. How many car seats is it in that car, by the way, that you move about with your little brothers and sisters and all those, those children? It's amazing. You have the same calmness your dad does. This young lady loves her family, her community, and I think that's a really good thing indeed. And now, I'd like to introduce Mr. Smith, our principal at the high school. Our former principal, how good are you? Thank you, Debbie. Uh, you certainly heard how impressive uh, this young lady's resume is. Uh, she's extremely busy and she does an excellent job in and outside of the classroom. And I just want to uh, speak for a moment uh, about how she conducts herself and how she has completed these goals to this point of her life. This young lady consistently conducts herself in a mature, responsible manner. She's highly organized and she quietly leads her peers by example. She is extremely considerate of others and is highly respected by her peers and adults alike. This young lady, uh, I've never seen it, maybe, maybe, maybe some other places, but I've never seen this young lady not positive, not enthusiastic. Uh, she's always greets you with a smile and conducts yourself in an extremely responsible manner all the time. And she's, she's very busy. You know, how many brothers do you have? Ten? Ten brothers? <laughs> uh, I just want to just give you a little outline of the, uh, the Student of the Year program. It's really in its 11th year now. Um, this year was extremely competitive. Uh, just a little uh, information about, about the criteria. Uh, to be even selected uh, to go to the next round, so to speak, you have to have accumulated over 100 hours of community service. And you have, of course, you have to be an honorable student. Uh, this year, there were 12 
candidates eligible um, to be interviewed. So it's a very tough uh, task for the interview committee, and I want to certainly thank them for their work. Um, but just to let you know how competitive it was, uh, the 12 students collectively up to this point uh, have volunteered 3,081 hours, just the 12. The class, the senior class, the class of 2012, it's kind of funny when it's in this year when we hear that, right? Uh, the, the group, the entire group have contributed 5,907. So you see how um, busy those 12 students were. But you should, should know that our winner, um, that will be uh, asked to come forward in a couple minutes this evening to receive her Student of the Year award. Just herself has contributed 611 hours on her own. That's, that's outstanding. So I just wanted to say, just personally, I've, I've been involved um, in, in the past 10, 10 years, and uh, this year's recipient is certainly uh, very, very deserving. Finally, I just would like to thank, as I mentioned before, the interviewing committee uh, who participated. A uh, very tough job at the Littleton area of Chamber of Commerce. And of course, I want to thank the Eames family. Thank you very much for your continued support and financial assistance for the Student of the Year Award. Thank you very much. Good evening. And it's great to be here tonight. Um, it's indeed an honor to be honoring this young woman who um, was one of the reasons that I find myself at Littleton High School. Littleton interview process for principal was the only district where students made up the second interview committee. Um, in my 12 years as a principal, eight as a high school teacher in Hartwood, Vermont, I have never heard of such a thing. And for me, that was a dream come true because I'm looking for a school where students can be empowered to do the right thing. And this senior class, we don't need to empower them. They are one of the finest citizens I have worked with. And yes, Chamber had a very difficult decision to make for this selection. This young lady and I have worked together ever since I moved to the area this summer. We planned the opening assembly for our whole school, which for the first year in recent history was a 7 to 12 school. And the organization that was carried through by student council president and this young person that we're going to honor tonight was outstanding. Working with her on that assembly and working with her on other many projects we have worked together on in the past four months, I learned a lot. I learned something every time we interact. And yet, with all the success, as she has appeared on my principal's report many times, everything that she does, with all that she has going for her, it's one of the most down-to-earth human beings I have ever, ever met. So it is indeed my pleasure and honor to introduce our Outstanding Student of the Year, Ms. Emma Cook. Congratulations, Emma. Definitely worthy of that. 
Um, I have a few things where I recognize our retiring directors, but I have a correction to make. Um, when I was introducing our new directors, I introduced Jody Hodgman from Smaha and Russell. I just learned that uh, he was made partner last week. And so it is now... I should have recognized him as being from Smaha, Russell, and Jody. So, uh, <laughs> congratulations, Jody. Uh, retiring directors, we have some folks leaving this year. Two of them aren't here. Uh, Wendy Mason from the hospital and Jan Cullen from Woodsville Guarantee. Both uh, served for numerous years and had tremendous energy and we'll, we'll miss them. Um, and we appreciate all of their, their efforts. Dan Cullen will be retiring. Dan? Dan is, um, Dan, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dan's the only person in this room that's excited to have no snow. Um, did you get 9 or 18 in today, Dan? <laughs> Dan, congratulations. Uh, Gerald Wynn. Gerald? Gerald has been a longtime member of um, the Chamber Board and Town Moderator for 40 years. Led us with the uh, Community Project. But perhaps most importantly, Gerald was able to get his daughter Carrie involved in the Chamber. And Carrie is also retiring this year. Carrie, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Gerald. George Kirk thinks he's retiring. Allow him to nominally step aside, but we'll still be relying on him for arm twisting whenever we need that to happen. Thank you, George. <laughs> Brad Bailey is retiring, and I'd like to thank Brad as well. Brad was in charge of uh, getting us our keynote speaker this evening, and we know he did a, a great job. We appreciate him. Uh, we're very thrilled to have Governor Huntsman here. Also, it's, um, we had a lot of discussion on the keynote speaker heading into this year's uh, dinner. We had some feedback from last year. Um, <laughs> quite a bit. Including this little note Bill from a friend of mine. What kind of sane person invites Bill Lee to speak at a... Oh, never mind. <laughs> but but we, what we said with, uh, with Brad, um, some of the criteria that we wanted, the you know, candidate viable, some exciting. Um, we didn't necessarily want to hear about what a beep -boop, beep -boop, uh, <laughs> a guy from the Yankees who broke Bill's beep -boop collarbone in 1978. Uh, we don't want to hear about what a beep -boop, beep -boop Don Zimmer was in real life. And we'll have no comments on the distance uh, estimating acumen of the hardworking constabulary of Harvard Vermont. Uh, so, so Brad took that. Took that difficult criteria and made, <laughs> and made an excellent selection. So, Brad, thank you very much. Thank you. Brad, Brad and Wayne Morello will be doing a Citizen of the Year. Good evening. Beginning with its annual meeting in January 1969, the Littleton Area Chamber of Commerce instituted an annual recognition of outstanding contributions to the community life known as Citizen of the Year. Tonight's recipient will be added to the distinguished names of past honorees listed in your program this evening. At this time, I would like to ask Mr. Wayne Morello to please come forward. best describe tonight's recipients of the Citizen of the Year Award. Since retiring and moving to Littleton, they both have been community oriented from day one. Upon their arrival, they brought with them new banners for Main Street. These banners were a retirement gift from a previous employer. This was really the beginning as they parlayed their advertising skills to promote Littleton. They quickly started organizing and working on events such as the Trout Tournament, Littleton's Art Show, the Farmer's Market, 
frostbite follies, and the Christmas parade. Spending countless hours organizing, planning, and fundraising. Due to their efforts, these events not only enrich our community, but also have brought tourists from far and wide. Both of the recipients of the Citizen of the Year Award served on several committees, such as the Main Street Committee, the Town Budget Committee, the Chamber Board, Friends of the Littleton Public Library, and the hiring panels for the Littleton Police Department. In most cases, they not only served on the committees, but they also led them. Several years ago, they were recognized for their contributions to the community by receiving a non-Rotarian Paul Harris Fellowship Award. One of the most impressive feats the recipients of this award have accomplished was the installation of Littleton's live stream video on Main Street. The digital camera uploads live video to WMUR Channel 9 every day. The task of getting this project up and running was one that took countless months of hard work. These recipients took numerous trips to Manchester where they spoke with the CEO of WMUR. They spent hours researching the best cameras, technical support, and even the best camera angles, and somehow they pulled it all together. Even though they have stopped serving on the boards, the recipients of tonight's Citizen of the Year Award still volunteer at Ridge, uh, Littleton Regional Hospital and donate their time reading to uh, young children at uh, Lakeway Elementary School. I do feel that there is much more to come from these two, so the next time you're at the Italian Oasis and you listen very carefully, you can hear these two scheme, scheming up new ways to promote Littleton and its surrounding areas. The recipients of this award were not born in Littleton. They fell in love with the area and decided to retire here and call it home. They got involved because they are thoughtful and caring people, giving their time, talents, and energy to a community they admire and respect. And with that, it's my great pleasure to announce two very dear friends as this year's Citizen of the Year Award recipients, George and Janice Kirk. Good evening. The New Hampshire primary is just four days away. The Littleton Area Chamber of Commerce has a long history of presidential candidates addressing our members. Regardless of your political views or party affiliation, this will be a very important presidential election. And here in New Hampshire, we take this very seriously. We've all heard of this year's candidates and are quite familiar with their positions. 
However, our guest speaker this evening is a candidate that has not received as much attention from the media as some of the other candidates. Governor Huntsman's political career began in 1988 when he went to Washington and worked in the Reagan White House. He became the youngest ambassador in over 100 years when in 1992, President George H.W. Bush appointed him U.S. Ambassador to Singapore. In 2001, President George W. Bush chose him to fill the post of Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, where he helped negotiate dozens of free trade agreements with Asian and African nations. Heading back home to Utah in 2004, John Huntsman ran for governor and won, receiving almost 58% of the vote. While governor, he was praised by the Cato Institute for cutting taxes by $400 million, reducing the state sales tax and simplifying the tax code. When he ran for re-election in 2008, he received a vote of confidence when he claimed almost 78% of the votes cast. Rising above party politics, he answered the call of his country once again when President Obama asked him to serve as ambassador to China, where he was unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. In the private sector, as a successful businessman, John Huntsman worked in the family business, which built hundreds of products and employed thousands of people while competing and expanding globally. In his personal life, Governor Huntsman and his wife Mary Kay, who's here this evening, have seven children, including two adopted girls from China and India. Governor Huntsman opted out of the Iowa caucus choosing to focus on the New Hampshire primary. As he said publicly, they picked corn in Iowa. New Hampshire picks presidents. Please join me in a warm North Country welcome for tonight's speaker, Governor John Huntsman. Thanks for that very kind introduction. I was asked at a town hall meeting the other night what we should say to those coming in from Iowa. And I simply said, welcome to New Hampshire. Nobody cares about what happens in Iowa. <laughs> this is where presidents are picked. Look out about that. Jim, it's a pleasure to be with you. Alicia, welcome to your new responsibilities with Littleton Chamber of Congress. This is a great representative sampling of small businesses and volunteers and community members coming together. This is what makes America great. And everyone is here to kind of make their community and citizens of their area better because of your volunteer spirit. And I think that is pretty awesome. How is it that I know we're gonna do just fine in the New Hampshire primary? First of all, there are more motorcycle riders in this state per capita than any state in the As a 40-year motorcycle rider, I like our chances here in New Hampshire. This is also a state, ladies and gentlemen, that loves its guns. I say with a name like Huntsman. How can you lose? A state that loves its veterans. I've got two boys in the United States Navy. They're learning the meaning of service and sacrifice and dedicating their lives to country. How else do I know we're gonna do well in the New Hampshire primary? I carry Ray Burton's comb in my pocket. the real secret weapon of success in New Hampshire is. <laughs> but let me tell you what an extraordinary journey this is. I am just a guy from the West. You come out here and you land in New Hampshire. This is a New Hampshire primary. It doesn't get any better than this, for heaven's sake. We've got 161 public events in this great state. Have I developed sort of a New Hampshire accent through it all? Of course I have. 
an addiction to lobster rolls? You bet I have. A love for the people of this state? No question about it. It is an extraordinary place. I just have to tell you that uh, visiting Dover a couple of months ago, I was greeted not by this wonderful introduction like Brad offered, I was greeted by a goat. <laughs> who then went on to bite my knee, which made headlines. My speech didn't make headlines. The goat biting my knee made headlines. Uh, after which I got a, a Christmas card from the goat. And it had inscripted on it, sorry about the knee. I showed up in Dover uh, again about a week ago the goat was there to greet me again, festooned with Huntsman stickers all over his body. And I say, only in New Hampshire, folks, only in New Hampshire. Proving the point that not only do they have to shake hands with every citizen in this state 15 times to win their vote, the goats are even hard to get, for heaven's sake. I will be mercifully brief, because I know uh, the way you're going to lose votes running for the highest office in the land is to groan on and on and on. So let me get it. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> let, let me get right to the point. Um, this is a great country. Uh, this is an extraordinary country. I've lived overseas four times, and I've seen this country from 10,000 miles away. The, we're the finest people in the world. We gotta pull together as Americans. I don't care whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat, whether you're an independent. We're not gonna find solutions to our problems out there until we remember that we must pull together as Americans, first and foremost, that's our tradition in this country. We pull together, we find solutions, we make the world a better place, and we move on. I'm running for President of the United States because I think it's totally unacceptable that we are, for the first time in recent history, handing over the greatest nation that ever was, the United States of America, as I stood before college students today, St. A's. We're handing it over to the next generation less good, more divided, more saddled with debt, less productive, less competitive than the nation we got. You know, folks, we have a tradition in this country. We hand upward, always, generation after generation. We hand up our values, our standing in the world, our economy. We're handing it down this time for the first time ever. All we have as people is this thing called humanity that we prepare for the next generation. And it's a representative sampling of who we are. Our economy, the respect we show one for another, our standing in the world. And I'm not satisfied with the country that we're ready to pass down to the next generation. And I say, we've got to take some steps to improve it before that happens. Two quick thoughts I want to leave you with. You can't get up and promise people without being disingenuous that you're going to solve all of the problems overnight. I'm not that kind of politician. I don't pander. I don't play those games. I don't sign silly pledges like all the other Republicans do on the stage. I just won't do that. But I think this nation needs to begin a journey to get us out of the hole. And I believe we've got two big issues we've got to get our arms around immediately, and they're both deficits. The first is an economic deficit called 15 trillion dollars in debt. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't a debt problem, it is a national security problem. When you get debt, when you get debt that is 80, 90 percent GDP, debt to GDP, you just don't grow. You can't compete. You can't provide opportunity for the next generation. I say, we're beyond the point in time where we can have sacred cows. I love these discussions with the budget. Defense Department needs to be off the table. Medicare needs to be off the table. Nonsense! We've all got to pull together as citizens of this great country and figure out how we're going to make cuts. It's going to require a shared sacrifice on the part of everybody in order to get spending from 24% of our GDP down to 19%, which is more sustainable. But you know what's really possible around the bend? I think this nation is ready to launch a manufacturing renaissance. Now, thank you. We are 25% of the world's GDP. We have the most productive worker on Earth. We forget about that sometimes. We've got the greatest colleges and universities anywhere on Earth. And I say, we've got to break out of the box. 
There's a psychological barrier in this country right now that is keeping us from getting back on our feet. And I say, having lived over in China for the last couple of years, having lived in Asia four different times, China's coming down. We always think of China as this model that is gonna take us over at some point. Mm, think again. They're coming down in terms of GDP growth, coming down from eight, nine, 10% growth for 30 years running to more four, five, six percent GDP growth. Inflation is going up, cost of manufacturing is on the increase, and so is unemployment. When unemployment rises in China, so does that thing called uncertainty, which means the risk profile going forward is gonna be a whole lot different. And that investment dollar that always lands conveniently in China will be looking for an alternative. And I say, we in this country would be crazy if we didn't recognize the trends that were playing out in the international economy and prepare this nation for what it's gonna to take to get back in the game. Of course, we've gotta fix our tax code. It's a 1955 Chevy trying to travel on the superhighway of the 21st century, and we wonder why we can't compete. Of course, we have to fix our regulatory environment. Of course, we have to take steps toward greater energy independence, all of which are doable and all of which are part of the plan that I put forward. But I am excited, ladies and gentlemen, to do for this country what I helped to do in my own state a great state with wonderful people. We were losing our college graduates. That's always a sign of some distress. You're losing your intellectual property, your brain power for tomorrow. Our entrepreneurs weren't terribly active. We weren't getting investment. We fixed our taxes. We improved the regulatory environment. We improved our education. And we got back in the game. That's exactly what this nation needs to do. But I am convinced that we can address the economic deficit before it becomes ruinous for the next generation. That's an obligation that we should have for the next generation. Deficit number two is not an economic <coughs> deficit. It's a deficit of another kind. And I would argue it is equally corrosive as the economic deficit. It's called a trust deficit. Because the people of this country no longer trust their institutions of power and have very little trust in their elected officials. And I say, how pathetic is this? The greatest nation that ever was, founded on institutions of trust, and we are running on empty folks. What do we do? I look at Congress, and I say, 8% approval rating? Give me a break. Where are these people hiding out? Everyone knows that Congress needs term limits. There's this institution called incumbency that reaches up and grabs people and grows very deep roots and pretty soon nobody wants to leave when we wonder why there's crony capitalism on Capitol Hill. And I say, I don't just want to talk about it as president. I want to lead the charge around this country, rallying public support because I think it's the public will to do whatever needs to be done to move forward term limits and also closing the revolving door that allows members of Congress to file right on through to become lobbyists, trading in on their insider relationships and insider information, making millions of bucks by doing so. And it's no wonder there's no believability or trust toward Congress. No trust. I look at the executive branch, ladies and gentlemen. The president's a good man. I respect him. But he hasn't led when this nation has so desperately needed it. A bipartisan commission report called Simpson Bowles, full of great ideas for tax reform and cutting around debt and spending, lands right on his desk, throws it in the garbage can because the political will isn't there. I say no leadership, no trust in the executive branch. I look at our tax code and I say, if you can afford a lobbyist or a lawyer on Capitol Hill, you too can get a carve out or a deduction. Look at the tax code, folks. It has become corrupt. I had a great conversation with Alan Simpson the other night, the author of the Simpson-Bowles Commission report. He said, remember, in that tax code, one trillion, one hundred billion dollars of nonsense. It's a drag on our economy year over year with no oversight. It just keeps lobbyists in business year over year. I put forward a tax code that says, clean out the cobwebs. Clean them all out, lower the rate, broaden the base, and simplify. Same thing I did as governor. 
It's completely doable. We just need a little bit of leadership. And on the business side, I say no more corporate welfare and no more subsidies because this nation can't afford it anymore. And I believe it has a drag on our overall competitiveness. I want to get trust back into our tax code. I look at our wars abroad and I say no trust. We've been at the war on terror for 10 years and we have paid a price as people. We have paid in some cases the ultimate sacrifice. Someone asked me a while ago, what was the hardest thing you ever had to do as governor? And I, you know, reflected for a moment. They expected, I'm sure, some tussle with the legislature, a fight over some major policy debate or enacting uh, tax reform or health care reform, wasn't any of that. So when I went over to Afghanistan to meet our forward deployed troops, and as governor, your commander in chief of the National Guard, which was a great honor and privilege to be able to serve in that capacity. We had many serving in Afghanistan. I landed in Kabul, and I was told by somebody from the embassy that we had just lost one of our guardsmen that day in a firefight on the Pakistan border. Would I be willing to eulogize him at a memorial service that evening? Well, of course I would do that. I'd never met Scott Lundell, but I wanted to eulogize him as his governor. So I showed up at an auditorium that was full of a couple hundred dirty, bedraggled soldiers who had been out in the field that day, there to eulogize Second Lieutenant Scott Lundell, a man I'd never met before. In front of me was his rifle and his boots and some keepsakes that were near and dear to him. And I mustered all of the courage and confidence I could as I sat there and thanked him for the service that he'd given to his country. One of the hardest things I'd ever had to do. And then I did something that was even harder. I gathered his personal belongings and had a few things that were keepsakes from his kids, uh, from his wife, and I carried them all the way back home to Salt Lake City, Utah. And I got in my car and I drove out to his wife's home. And I knocked on her door and she answered, she was standing there with four kids. And I said, uh, on behalf of a grateful state and a grateful nation, I just want to thank you and your family for paying the ultimate sacrifice. And with that, I handed over her husband's personal belongings, gave her a hug and hugged her kids. The hardest thing I ever did as governor. I'm an emotional guy, that was tough. And um, every time I think about the sacrifice this country has made, I reflect on Janine Lundell, a strong and stoic woman who stood there and said in response, he died doing what he believed was right for his country. And because of that, I can carry on. I thought, only in America. That's powerful stuff. But I look at Afghanistan, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to tell the American people that we have achieved what we as a country need to achieve. We've run the Taliban from power. We've upended and dismantled al-Qaeda. They're in sanctuaries in Waziristan and beyond. We've had free elections. Osama bin Laden is no longer around. We have strengthened civil society, their military and police. I believe it's time for our troops to come home. And the reason is this. I don't want to be nation building in Southwest Asia when this great nation so desperately needs to be built. It needs our attention, ladies and gentlemen. We need to focus on who we are and rebuilding our core because it is crumbling. And when you have a crumbling core, you cannot project the values that we are so famous for in the world, liberty and democracy and human rights and free markets. And I would argue that when this country is strong, and I've seen it strong living overseas before, we move people. We change the course of history like no other country on earth. And I want to get strong again because that is our most powerful weapon when you stop to think about it. It's not planes, it's not ships, it's not missiles, it's our values and our ability to project those values. I want to bring trust back to our foreign policy. I want to tell the American people this simple truth, I believe. Afghanistan is not our nation's future. Iraq is not our nation's future. 
Our nation's future is how well prepared we are as people to rise up and meet the competitive challenges of the 21st century. And that's about economics, and that's about education. And that's gonna play out over the Pacific Ocean in countries that I have lived in before. And I've seen what those countries are doing to prepare for the future. And without a hint of hyperbole intended, until we get our act together right here at home, we will see the end of the American century by 2050. And that is not the legacy that we're gonna to leave to the next generation. I'm sorry, they're too good and they deserve better. I look at Wall Street and I say, no trust? Banks that are too big to fail? What is this all about? Dodd-Frank? Financial legislation that makes it difficult for small businesses to get loans? I was in Keene a little while ago, and I walked into a place called Lindy's Diner, where all former presidents have visited. And I walked in and they said, hey, you're the first candidate this go around to walk into Lindy's. I say, I like our chances. That sets us up perfectly. I went over to the counter and sat next to Jamie. I'd never met Jamie before. He struck up a conversation, asked him what he did. He said, I repair old motorcycles. I said, how's business? He said, I want to expand. I really don't have uh, many others helping me. He said, but I want to expand my business. He said, I have no debt. Yet I can't get a loan from the bank because they're asking for a coverage requirement that is so high and so onerous that if I could cover the coverage requirement, I wouldn't need a loan to begin with. What's this all about? He said, we're frozen. Our system is frozen. He said, when I grew up in Keene, I had 30 jobs growing up. I could leave one and go to another, then another. We had four machine tool shops in this town. He said, not that way today. He said, you told me, but I believe we can get there again. He was telling me exactly what I had in mind about this industrial renaissance that I know is possible in this country. Banks that are too big to fail, ladies and gentlemen. Six institutions that combined have assets that are equal to two-thirds of our nation's GDP. $9.5 trillion. If they get sick and if they go down, they're going to get a bailout. Because if they fail, we all fail. I say, what kind of deal is that? We've been there, we've done that, we bailed them out before, we're not going to bail them out again. I say, if you're too big to fail, you are too big. Because capitalism without failure isn't capitalism. And we're setting up big banks to look like public utilities, and I say, this isn't what we need in our future. We need a president who's going to say, you're all trying to do the best you can, but we're going to right-size those banks. We're going to take them from where they are today down to the size they were in the 1990s, where if you screwed up, you got sick, you could fail, and you wouldn't take the rest of us down. I want trust in Wall Street and in our economic institutions again. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the underdog in the race, let me just swear with you. And I would not be the crass salesman that I am unless I asked for your vote. So, with all due respect to the leadership here, I need your vote and your help. And I remain a great optimist in this country, and I'll just end with this because I've lived 10,000 miles away and I've seen the light of this nation shine and inspire and influence people from 10,000 miles away. We have everything a nation would ever want to succeed. And we sometimes don't even see it on ourselves. We get down, we get in a funk, we get dispirited. That's not who we are. We're a bunch of blue sky problem solving can do optimists. That's, that's who we are as Americans. We're in a hole, we gotta get out. And I have every confidence to think that we're going to get out. But from 10,000 miles away, you look at this country and you say, we've got stability. We've got rule of law. We have the longest surviving constitution in the world. We have private property rights, still even here in New Hampshire. <laughs> we have the greatest colleges and universities in the world, and people still flock here from all over to attend them. We have the most entrepreneurial, creative, and innovative people on earth, the creative class. They're our engine of growth, and today they're sitting on their hands because there's no confidence in our tomorrow. We've got to change that part. And we have a pretty brave and courageous armed force.
workforces. I think the best this country has ever seen. And I'll be darned if we're gonna let the men and women from the theaters of combat, the front lines, come back to the unemployment lines. That's not gonna happen. They're gonna come back to dignity and respect and appreciation. And they're gonna come back to jobs. And like the greatest generation before them, they're gonna help rebuild this country because they are the new greatest generation. Ladies and gentlemen, we can get it done. We need leadership, we need confidence, we need a plan, and I need your help. I ask for your vote. You know what else I'm asking for? I'm asking for your trust. Because at the end of the day, that's what you're asking for when you ask for a vote. You're asking for somebody's trust. And there isn't anything more valuable than that, that one human being can give to another. I get that part. I recognize that awesome responsibility and I will handle it wisely and make you proud. Thank you all so very much for having me here tonight.